Welcome to Same Spit, Different Face TV, where my opinions is facts, and if you don't like my opinions, you can start your own podcast, and it's free, so don't forget to spit on the like button, the subscribe button, and the notification bell. I'm Fairplay 2333, and we're here with the first episode of Same Spit, Different Face podcast. Now, we're going to talk about different topics in the culture and things that I feel is relevant, not you. Now, the first thing that I think I want to talk about, they say that they're about to take the Breakfast Club off of Atlanta syndication. And a long time ago, Maul, ex-co-host of the Joe Budden podcast, said that the Breakfast Club was falling off. I don't think that the Breakfast Club is actually falling off. I just think that they don't move the pulse of the culture like they used to. Now, I think just coming to the show is what they needed, but... If we're going to be honest, man, I think they need another A mic. I think Charlemagne has really changed his perspective. I think Charlemagne needs to step into a higher role. Now, a lot of times when we talk about people who gatekeep and people who sit in those high positions, I think sometimes they sit there and they don't understand that they've outcultured the culture. And Charlemagne talks all the time about how like these old white men sit in a position and they don't understand how to move the needle and they don't know what it takes to move the needle and they need to have younger people around them to tell them what's relevant. Well, I think Charlemagne has actually moved into that point of his career where he needs to have younger people around him in order to tell him what's cool, what's culture, what's popping. But also, he needs to find someone else to sit in that A seat. I also think that uh, DJ Envy has ran his course as the DJ on that show. I think Jess is a breath of fresh air. I think what she does is amazing on that show. But I think they just need somebody different in those seats. Now, if I had to replace Charlemagne with somebody, I would replace Charlemagne with Boosie. If um, I had to replace DJ Envy with somebody, I don't know a lot of DJs, so y'all can pick a DJ. But if I had to pick a personality, I would say Desi Banks would be the person that I would replace him with. Uh, Boosie is going to give you that co-host who's going to give you them sound bites every week. Boosie going to say whatever comes to his mind. Boosie is going to be somebody who's culturally relevant. Boosie is going to give his opinion on Instagram. Boosie is going to have everything lined up for people to understand what's going on and uh the people going to rally around Boosie because they feel like Boosie one of the realest to ever do it. Now, um Desi Bank, I just think he's super popular. I just think that he would be the one who can hold it together. I think he would be the male version of what uh Charlemagne is now, but the difference is People won't look for any shock value from him because he's never been a shock value person. And I think he has a lot of relationships. Um, I think Boosie has a lot of relationships. And then I think they just keep Jess there. And what Jess do with Jess with the mess, the way she handles the news in that situation, I think that is amazing. So to me, it's unfortunate that The Breakfast Club is actually being taken off Atlanta uh, Radio 105.3, but I think it needs to be done in order for change to be done. And I think now since this happened, I Heart will start to look for a difference in change. And Charlemagne could stay on the radio for a while, but I would think within like the next five years, three to five years, maybe sooner, if they smarter, they'll transition Charlemagne into a real position of power at iHeart so it can look like um, he's elevating his career and it don't look like he getting demoted or fired and you put somebody else in that position. And like I said, preferably Boosie. Here's a quick shameless plug. If you like everything power universe, like power raising Canaan, Power Book Ghost, Power Book Force. I have a power channel that you should tune into. Um, and I talk about everything. It's on YouTube. It's called Power Book Multiverse and Cinema. Um, right now, we are at like 7,800 followers in only the last four months. So come over to that page and see what all the hype is about. Now, let's talk about the 
NBA MVP and how I think the voting system is flawed. So when we look at the MVP ladder right now, we got uh, Jokic at number one, SGA at number two, Luke at number three, Giannis at number four, Jason Tatum at number five, um, Sabonis at number six, Anthony Edwards at number seven, uh, Jalen Bronson at number eight, Kevin Durant at number nine, and Booker at number 10. Now, one of the things I really don't like about this is Anthony Edwards is sitting in the two spot in the West, and he's sitting at number seven, while Luka Doncic is sitting at number five in the West, and Shea Gilgrich Alexander is sitting at number two in the West, yet these players are ranked higher than him. I mean, Shea, Shea, SGA is sitting at number three in the West, but they ranked higher than Anthony Edwards in the MVP vote, and even when we look at Sabonis, He's sitting at number eight in the West, and he's ranked at number six, which is also above Anthony Edwards. If I had to pick right now by team, Anthony Edwards would be my clear-cut MVP. He's actually been carrying this team without Cat. But one thing I think, I think it's a European player agenda. Um, the NBA feel like they already have the American fan base in the Choco, and what ends up happening when somebody like Jokic or somebody like Luka Doncic, or somebody like SGA, somebody like Giannis, or, or even Sabonis win that MVP, or it looks as if they're in a position to win that MVP, what ends up happening is that um, those people from that country, they rally around them, they buy their jerseys. But not only that, you get more children ingratiated into the sport, which you get more children to pick up a basketball which means the NBA brand grows and gets bigger globally. So um, I may be a conspiracy theorist when I say this, but I always think that there has been a, a European agenda just to get players over here in order to grow the brand. But the conspiracy is, is they're doing all this in um, the name of money, not because they want to really see the game grow, not because they really want to see these players win MVPs and not because they think these players are great. Don't get me wrong. These players are great, right? Now, Jokic, I can understand why he's at number one, but my problem with him is that he shouldn't have won the last two MVPs he was supposed to win because he was a five seed and an eight seed. In the past, they didn't give Kobe Bryant an MVP, the one he had over Steve, the one Steve Nash won over him because they said that his seeding was too low. Now, when we look at Luka Doncic, like I said, um, his seeding is not only low at five, but he also played with Kyrie Irving, who's another top tier player. Now, Giannis, we got to just look at him and say he's been carrying that team. So I would actually put him at about two, even though he got Dame in that trade, he played better with Dame, but they've also fell off since then. So I can understand why he's at four. Um, Anthony Edwards don't really have any help over there. Kevin Durant and Devin Booker being in a top 10 is atrocious to me since uh, they're playing with each other. And so it's just like they need to come up with a clear color um, thought process of how to get the MVP. So right now you have to beat them play the minimum amount of games. I think that's good of 65 games, but I think they need to go a little more in depth. And I think they need to make it where your team needs to be in the top three of either conference to be in that top five of MVP voting. And then I think another way they can shift balance in the league is they can say, if you have um, another player on your team averaging 25 or more, you can't be in that top. Um, you can't be in that top five. It's, it's just it's just all weird to me. But anyway, man, that's how the MV that's how the NBA is running a MVP finals ladder. And I think they're doing the league and I think they're doing a fan base a disjustice. LeBron James and J.J. Reddick podcast. I'm going to keep this short and sweet. I don't like it. I feel like LeBron James is doing it to try to control the narrative 
of his legacy on his way out the league. Um, I believe that la next year will be his last year playing basketball. He will definitely try to play with Bronny. Will Bronny transition with him over to the Cleveland Cavaliers, or will they stay with the Lakers? Who knows? But um, I don't like this podcast because it's self-serving. It's not really trying to teach us the basketball game. It's um, centered around trying to change his legacy and change the perception of where people see him at as the GOAT. And that's all I want to say about that. Your boy Lil Uzi Vert, he went out to a concert and he basically trolled being gay. That's what the fans are saying. And he stood up on stage and he was like, yo, I know y'all been thinking this about me for a little time and I know y'all probably been knowing, but now it's time for me to come out and tell y'all. And then he paused for a second and he say, I love y'all. Now, um, it's been a lot of speculations about his sexuality, but I think this is just him trolling. Do I believe he gay? No. Do he act like a flexible guy? Of course he does, but I just think it's a part of the era. I think it's a part of what he grew up in. And um, I know a lot of people say that he from the streets of Philly. I personally don't think he from the streets of Philly. I think that he got people from the streets of Philly behind him. But I think he's just a good kid, just living his life, making music, doing his thing. I do think that he's come to a point in his career where um, he's actually getting older and he need to try to grow his style out of that. Um, I don't want to say like the innocent child stage, but he kind of does that like playful. Like, OK, what I would compare him to is like Michael Jackson. Um, from the standpoint of just how Michael Jackson never really grew up out of that kid stage because he was deprived a childhood. I don't think Lil Uzi Vert was deprived of childhood. I think that Lil Uzi Vert found a lane that worked for him and he haven't really figured out that um he the the fans around him are getting older. And he's staying in that same music mental capacity from an image standpoint, not from music, because um, I've listened to a bunch of songs like uh, he got a song with Pusha T. I can't remember the name of it right now, but he slid on that. So Lil Uzi Vert can really rap. He really does make decent music, but I think his image, his vibe, the way he danced, the way he talked, the way he bat his eyes, that throws a lot of uh purest hip-hop fans off to him now y'all can have whatever thought process y'all want to have about Lil uzi vert that's just my thought process of it but i feel like he has to um evolve in his image and um stop trolling you know what i'm saying he trolls to get attention and that little tension is cool for the moment being but it isolates a lot of people from him um and I don't think he gains much from doing that at this point in his career, except for a couple of small clicks. I think he solidified as who he is in the hip hop space. And I think he's been in it long enough and he's built a, enough cult fan as to where he can just do his thing and ride the rest of his career out and drop albums and still sell between that um, 80K to 150K mark. Another shameless plug, if you like comedy, if you like skits, if you like Chicago informative information in the form of Chicago do's and don'ts, um, join my Instagram at F-A-I-R-P-L-A-Y underscore 2333. Also join my YouTube page, Fair Play. 2333 and it's a space between fair play and 2333 polo g was busted with a gun in the manhattan hotel and i definitely think this is something that polo g can beat why do i think it's something polo g can beat because i don't believe that the gun is his even if it is his right you're gonna have to tie those fingerprints to him you're gonna have to prove that you cleaned that room thoroughly you're gonna have to prove that he didn't find that pistol inside that room and then just said you know what i'm gonna just keep it here keep it safe and i'm gonna turn it into the authorities or if he have a great enough lawyer he could say, hey, my client found this gun. He was going to turn this gun in, but because of his previous 
run-ins with the law, he has a lot of distrust for law enforcement, and he felt like it was better to leave the pistol there than to turn it in and have it be planted on him like you guys are trying to say it's his pistol now, even though it's not his. Now, I think what will make the difference is is if his DNA is on the clip. If he loaded that clip allegedly, I'm not saying he did. I don't believe it's his gun. But if he loaded that clip allegedly and he didn't have any gloves on or anything over his hand, if any fingerprints is inside of that clip, at this point, it's not a case of whether it's his gun or not. It's a case of how much time he's going to get in jail. Now, when you look at this situation, when you're talking about is it a case of if it's his gun or not, or if his fingerprints are on the inside of the clip. Now, at that point, his lawyer will be able to argue and say, my client prints are only on the inside of it because he wanted to check it to make sure if it was live ammunition in it or not. So it's a lot of ways you can try to finesse this. I think he could still get jail time, but if his lawyer finessed the narrative of why he didn't turn the gun in, why the gun isn't his, why he found the gun inside the hotel and they can make it stick and he can finesse that. I think you get a favorable deal where he plead guilty to like some misdemeanor and he gets something like probation for this situation and he walk away scot-free um, from the standpoint of he don't have to do any jail time and he don't get a felony put on his record. So I think that um, this is going to turn out good for him. And my um, call back to tell you why I think this could actually work, because NBA Youngboy got caught in a Rolls Royce. It was a gun inside of the Rolls Royce. And his lawyer argument was, hey, he's a multi-million dollar guy. He has a lot of friends. He has a lot of cars. He drive and switches out cars. Sometimes he leave his keys sitting in the cars and his friends just pick up the cars and drive them. He don't know which friend could have been driving anybody could have been driving this car um and it's no way for you to just say that this is his g gun because it was in the car because you found the gun inside the car and not on his purpose person and he had no knowledge of the gun being in the car so i see polo g wiggling right up out of this we have oj simpson who's dead at 76 years old he died of cancer caitlin kardashian formerly known as bruce jenner took to twitter to make a disparaging tweet against OJ Simpson. And I think it was really unnecessary. I didn't think it had to be made. A lot of people keep trying to call him a murderer, keep trying to allege that he did this. And OJ was found not guilty because it's something he didn't do. Whether you think he did it or not, that's on you, but you're not allowed to call him a murderer. Um, that's defamation of character. Now, I don't think you can defame the dead, so that's kind of the loophole to it. But also, um, with the people who own his estate, I believe by him being a celebrity, you can say you're defaming his brand because it may be other things that they may want to work out. It may be brand deals that they may be trying to put together for memorabilia, maybe sell off some of his assets, and that can depreciate um, the price that they can get to it by people constantly defaming his name. So a guy got on ESPN allegedly and called OJ Simpson a murderer allegedly. I think it was ESPN allegedly, but if I'm the family, I'm suing that guy and I'm suing ESPN for allowing him to say that on their platform, knowing that OJ Simpson was found not guilty. And even if I don't win this lawsuit, I'm throwing it out there in hopes that they just settle behind the scene because they don't want that publicity. Now, I would see ESPN fighting this because they wouldn't want it to come out that they just settled and gave OJ family more money after the Nicole situation, et cetera, et cetera, right? So when we look at these different situations and the way this is being handled, I think everybody should handle OJ Simpson with grace because it's a lot of things that people have done in their life or been accused of in their life. And um, they knew it wasn't true. And later it came out to not be true, but they still have that stigma on their name of something they did. And it doesn't have to be as big as you hurt somebody. It could be as small as you tried to talk to somebody, girlfriend or boyfriend that you didn't actually try to talk to, but that rumor went around about you. It can be as small as if you're a woman, somebody lied and said you um had your uh, menstrual cycle 
through your clothes and it was showing in class when you were in high school and that carried you around and made your high school experience that much more difficult, even though you know it wasn't true. If you're a man, you could have had a woman false accuse you of something in college that you know you didn't do. Um, I had a friend sit in jail for about three years because a woman lied on him about something like that took his basketball career away from him. He was able to have a pretty good basketball career, but not what it would have been if he didn't sit in jail for three years. And her father knew that that guy didn't do it, but the father is the one who told her to tell the police he did that because she he didn't like the fact that his white daughter was dating a black guy. So we have to be able to give people grace when we judge them for things that they've been found not guilty of. Because when we look at what time it was in the 90s, if OJ Simpson was guilty of what he did, they 100% would have put him in jail for that. At this current moment, Young Thug is still in court fighting his RICO case. Um, I haven't been following it closely anymore. It's been going on too long. It's been a circus, so to speak. And a lot of the witnesses who they're bringing up to the stands are saying, hey, I don't want to testify. I don't want to be here. Why do y'all have me on this stand? I don't know anything. Those things y'all talking about was years ago. I haven't been affiliated with that in years. I haven't done this. I haven't done that. So when you look at this standpoint, um, do I think Young Thug will be found guilty? Um, I don't think he'll be found guilty on the more serious charges, but it could happen. I don't think he'll be found guilty um, because there's sufficient evidence to prove that he's guilty. I think that he'll be found guilty because it'll be juror fatigue. When the jury have to sit there for all of these months, and you basically just throwing spaghetti against the wall, seeing what stick. You have 200 witnesses coming up. If the juror looks at it and say, well, those 150 people weren't credible, but um, the other 50 seemed a little bit more credible, or all of those 199 people seem like they BSing. But that one guy who got on the stand, he appeared to not be afraid of Young Thug. He appeared to say the right things about him. He appeared to have previous knowledge of the gang. He appeared to have been a hierarchy in the gang. He appeared to have um, a close standing relationship with Young Thug in the future, um, in the present, I mean. And he appeared to have the least to gain and the most to lose from getting on that stand, we believe him. So we're going to find Young Thug guilty. Now, what I think happened is um, Young Thug get found guilty from juror fatigue. And in five years, he's able to come back to court. Some laws get passed. A couple of things end up happening. And what he's able to do, he's able to say, well, let me up out of here. Uh, this didn't happen. That didn't happen. This shouldn't have been allowed in. That shouldn't have been allowed in. And now he's able to come back court and get a much fairer trial. I also think that if you're looking at YFE and Lucci and the DA is calling him all of these things, saying he's a, a gang leader and it's a Rico and he was involved in a shooting, although they try to specify that he wasn't the shooter, which we understand that, you know, not being a shooter, but in the law, if you if someone dies in the commission of a felony, it doesn't matter if you the shooter or not. It just matter if that person died and you get charged with a murder as well. So from that standpoint of things, um, it feels to me like uh, Fonnie Willis is making a difference in the situation. And I feel like the same way she gave YFE and Lucci a plea deal, I feel like she could have gave Young Thug a plea deal. But from my understanding, the only plea deal they were giving Young Thug is life. But then you turn around and give somebody else who was in a situation where somebody died, you give them like a 20-year uh, plea deal at a 10-year suspended sentence. You could have even gave Young Thug a 50-year, and I'm not saying I wanted to get a 50-year, but I'm saying you could have gave him a 50-year uh, pr uh, prison system. You could have gave him uh, his time served. You could have gave him some time suspended. And um, he could have been able to serve 
20 of those years at 85%. So he do about a good 10, 15 years and get out of jail. But in my opinion, it's personal. Now, I say that's my opinion because I don't know 100% for sure, but it damn sure comes off as if it's personal. The weekend took the time to dish Drake. Now, for everything that Drake has done for weekend career, and let's keep it 100, the weekend did a lot for Drake career as well with uh, his writing on Take Care. But when we look at this situation, would the weekend have been as big as he is now? If he wasn't attached to Drake when he first came out, if the weekend comes out under, um, let's say, J. Cole during that time, would he have the same impact he have now? I definitely think the weekend is talented. I definitely think he's a transcending talent. I definitely think he sets trends in music and he tries to make music outside the box. He don't try to make a variation of the same album he made. Uh, his first album, he don't try to make a variation of that album every year. He tries to do different things sonically and lyrically to um, elevate the music game and take it to a different tier and a different level. But I don't think that he is the weekend that we know today without Drake. So for him to be dissing Drake is crazy. But what's more important to me is what is going on behind the scenes that we don't know um drake is in a position to where he has a lot of labels on his side he's in a position where he has a lot of marketing dollars so to me i feel like something's going on behind the scenes maybe drake is in a contract dispute maybe drake is in some type of contract negotiations um and maybe um future metro booming uh Kendrick Lamar and others have found out that maybe it's some type of chink in Drake's armor or maybe it's something coming down the pipeline that they know about that we don't know about that they feel like okay this is the perfect time to attack Drake because he won't be able to be as effective because the label's not putting their marketing dollars behind him or he's falling off in his stream and I don't know what the thing is but when you think of a artist as big as Drake and you think about how uh, music is big business and how he's making people billions on billions of dollars, not just from his music, but from his brand, from his songwriting, um, from other endeavors that he take part in, you would have to assume that something's going on behind the scene that we don't know about. And I personally think maybe Drake will be trying to leave his label and go fully independent after seeing what a lot of independent artists are doing, who's big as him. I don't know what it is, but, um, and maybe the label is just like, Hey, if you're not gonna, uh, do this, we'll allow these people to, discredit your name and your legacy whereas maybe in the past the label was able to tell them they were coming in they would say hey this song is such and such and they'll be like hey it sounds like you're dissing somebody who is that about oh this is about drake and the label say no nah, we're not putting that out bro that that we're not putting that out because you know he's bringing so much money to the label are you sure you want to do that let's sit and think on it whereas now the label is like or maybe the label just like yo drake is on the end of his run and now let's just get as much money out of his situation as we can by putting as much controversy around him as we can because people are waiting on this reply from drake and this re reply whatever it be it, it it don't even have to be an a plus tier right if it's a b plus tier reply well then drake is in a great position to be back on top and it's debatable if he's the goat along by himself some people are calling this the apology around the world. Now, J. Cole um, got dissed by Kendrick Lamar. He actually dropped a diss called Seven Minute Drill. And he dissed Kendrick Lamar, basically discredited Kendrick Lamar albums and career. But then he came back and said his spirit wasn't sitting right. He didn't want to be that guy. He didn't want to be in the middle of the beef. And that's cool, man. I was standing next to him. I said that was mature. And I also said 
it's a lot of people in his crew who could be ready to crash out behind this. So when y'all looking for it, oh, we want entertainment, we want people to do this, and y'all looking at it and saying, oh, these is just rappers. They rapping. They not going to turn it into street beef. Well, everybody around them not a rapper. And one thing y'all have to understand about people entourages, people have to earn their keep. And a lot of people earn they keep in different ways. Um, some guys may go get the breakfast in the morning. Some buy, some guys may take and make the mall runs. And some guys, when beef happen, they make sure that the beef don't keep happening. They finish the beef for the artist. So it's a lot of things that can happen behind the scene. But um, what I don't like is that J. Cole came out and apologized. But then he allowed his feature to be on an album with uh metro booming and future where he know that they've been actively dissing drake and he's been saying like him and drake are friends and they cool and they this and they that now the only thing i can look at when i see this from this perspective is j cole was in a situation where he said yo this guy called my name um i'm riding with drake and drake riding with me but somebody came to J. Cole behind the scene and said, hey, you going against Kendrick Lamar when Kendrick Lamar never directly went at you, he actually was going at Drake and he just said your name or he just referenced the song you was on, but he never actually said nothing about you. Also, do you know that Drake had been doing X, Y, Z behind your back? Or do you know that Drake had been saying xyz behind your back and now j cole looks at that diss from kendrick lamar in a very different light or maybe even kendrick lamar texts him and say hey bro let's get on the phone and let me explain to you what's going on and after having that conversation j cole was like you know what kendrick isn't the problem drake <laughs> might be the problem so excuse me i'm interested to see what will happen in this situation? I'm interested to see how J. Cole will um stand forward in this situation. And uh I'm interested to see when Drake start dissing people, will he sneak diss J. Cole for basically apologizing, but then saying he don't want to be that person, he don't want to be in the middle of the beef, and he just here for hip hop and all of this, but then you hopping on a album where these people are actively dissing me and we just basically did tours together where i brought you out and bigged you up and said i loved you and called you my brother but anyway that was your first episode of same spit different face podcast well my opinions is facts and if you don't like my opinion you can start your own podcast follow me fairplay2333 on all platforms the handle would be at f a I R P L A Y underscore two three three three. Thank y'all for listening. Click the like button, the subscribe button, and the notification bell. Peace.